All right, today we're going to be talking about how to make a game in Flutter, um, not using any packages like Flame, uh, just straight up sort of Flutter. In fact, uh, there's only one dependency in this entire project. It is Riverpod, um, because I need something good for state management, uh, but everything else is just sort of like your native basic Flutter. Um, so this is a popular uh, casino game called Sick Bow. Uh, it goes by other names as well. Um, and the idea is you place bets on certain combinations. So you, for instance, could choose um, something like small. Um, and basically, you roll the dice. And if it is, if the number is small, meaning it's between um, 1 through 10, inclusive of 10, um, you would get your money back plus 1. Um, there's other things you can bet on, of course. You can bet on, you know, having two ones come up, which has better odds. This will give you a payback of uh, 11 to 1. Um, a triple is 180. <clears throat> and uh, a whole bunch of other things, you know, you can bet on um, th throughout this thing. Uh, it's a fun little game, um, you know, similar to roulette in some ways that you're kind of just, you know, picking spots and there's different odds. Uh, but I, I think it's a pretty fun game and I thought it'd be fun to try and make it in Flutter. <clears throat> So some sort of nuances going on here. Um, the game basically has a few different, each round has a few different phases. There's the betting round, which we're in right now. Uh, and basically you can choose, you know, oh, I wanna, you know, bet 20 on this one. You know, maybe I wanna bet five on here. Uh, we also allow uh, stacking, so I can have a five and a one, and you'll see they kind of come up. And what's pretty cool is uh, when you do get to, you know, 10, for instance, it's actually going to uh, cr automatically set it to, you know, a denomination that makes sense. Um, based on the ones we have access to. So we'll see how that works too. Uh, so you can bet on a whole bunch of things. You can also click on them to remove them. And when you're happy, you roll. And we'll see, we got our roll here and it will highlight all the ones that um, that are winning ones. And uh, you, you know, get money back or you lose your money um, in that case, or credits as we're calling it here. We also have a bit of a uh, history. So every time I, um, you know, roll, whether I bet or not, we'll actually see you know, the history stack getting added to here. Uh, and this is useful for, you know, if this was actually a real game, um, you know, people like to see, oh, what was rolled recently? Wow, there hasn't been a one in a long time. Obviously that means a one's coming up soon, which clearly is not true, uh, but it's how people think. So having a history is, you know, an important thing in a game like this. So um, I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. Um, you know, this took me better half of a day to uh, sort of figure out and build. And uh, rather than sort of rebuilding it from scratch and making this video, you know, probably a couple hours long, I really wanna try for something, you know, a little more short form based content today. So I'm going to walk through uh, the process here and kind of see how this is all put together, um, especially the parts of it that are, uh, you know, state management specific. Um, so we'll just uh, get a look at this now. And um, here we have our main.dart file, which is just the basic main with the, uh, you know, the, the default stuff sort of stripped out with the counter app. And um, all we do is we have our home is our game screen. So game screen is just a basic stateless widget, which has an app bar, um, and then it has a column uh, with a game with this game board component that we'll look at in a minute, as well as the role history list and the betting board. And uh, they're in this column, and game board is expanded, so it will take up you know as much space as possible. You also see um, I did do a bit of work on responsiveness, so it actually does kind of scale accordingly. Um, now, if you get it really small, uh, it would obviously be hard to read, and when you get it really really small, it's it's not good. Uh, that's something that could be fixed with, you know, laying things out in a different way, but um, that's not really the scope of what I was trying to do here. So uh, that's how we have that there. Um, and let's just look at our game board. So the game board, um, this file is pretty big because it is kind of consisting of all these different, you know, pieces and there's not really a good way to break this up. Yeah, we could make different components for each row, um, but I found that was kind of unnecessary, especially if we wanted to eventually like shift the layout around um, for mobile. Um, so you'll kind of see a lot of repetition in here. Uh, we got things like the screen width and screen height, and um, we have sort of a min and a max just in our constants file. Um, sorry, a min, a min width and a min height. And we just want to set the width and height of our board to whatever uh, the minimum of those two numbers are. So, uh, you know, if the min, if the width is smaller, we'll use that one. If the screen width is smaller, we'll use that one and we'll set that box. And that just kind of keeps it in this nice bounding um, box here. There you go. Uh, okay, so basically through here we have a column with a lot of rows in it. So one, two, three, four, five different rows. 
And within them are different, what I'm calling game tiles, and these represent these sort of boxes. And uh, what I decided to do is uh, kind of like use these different units of measurement. So this has a width of four units, and this has a height of four units. And we'll see how that all scales and sizes later. Um, but it allows us to kind of make this one bigger, um, you know, this way. So you see this is four by four, whereas this would be um, three by one. Um, if you kind of eyeball it, you can kind of see that. And uh, these game tiles themselves, um, basically, uh, have a bunch of stuff for the scaling sort of thing. So um, because I want to sort of actually scale things down, um, I'm actually just doing everything with the transform um, so that I can just work with sort of a standard font size and then scale accordingly. So we start by having the scale just set to one. Um, and then we check the screen width and screen height. Now I'm subtracting 154 from the height because uh, that's just making up for sort of the space here and the space here um, and just a, a little more padding. Um, but that's essentially the play area that we have access to. And um, we just check some things to see, you know, if we're less than the min width, we adjust the scale X, and we adjust the scale Y. And then we get the scale by just finding out what's the minimum thing we need to scale. So we just use our math min function again. And then all of our uh, widths and heights, we basically take whatever the width of this tile was. So again, that would be like four. Uh, we multiply it by a constant. Um, which is this thing called tile unit pixels. So in a perfect world, you know, one would be equal to 64. Uh, you know, with the one is 64 pixels, with the four would be, you know, four times 64. But then we do multiply that by the scale, and that just allows it to then shrink down when there's just not enough room for everything to fit. So there we have a bit of scaling stuff. Um, there's some stuff to sort of determine the colors and whatnot, and you can of course look at this on your own, but it essentially finds out, you know, if there was a, a winning bid and, and, and stuff um, to, you know, put yellow versus a yellow uh, with opacity of 0 0.4 or just this black color here. Um, now in the case that a game tile is not playable, and that's a property that can be passed in, um, sorry, it's not, that, I made a change, it's not no longer that, but if you don't pass a bid type in, it's not a playable space, so it actually becomes white. So you can't actually like, you know, interact with the space, whereas uh, if I was in betting mode, you can see I can hover these, these just are, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, these, uh, these game tiles, essentially, they get their width and height from all that scaling stuff up there. There's a inkwell on them, and uh, there's this function, can, or this property called can bid, which, um, you know, similarly, if you don't pass in a bid type, this will be false. But if you do, we check to make sure, okay, it, are we in the betting stage? Because if we're not, you can't bet right now. Um, and we want to make sure that their available credits are higher than the amount of, um, that they're trying to bid. So if you can, you can click. Cool. That's how we do that. And um, the I decided to use an animated container here rather than just a regular container. And that just allows the color to actually, when it goes to that yellow, so when I actually roll and you'll see the yellow actually fades in instead of it just instantly turning. So just a very simple way to do an animation there. Um, and then, yeah, within within each of these, so that kind of constructs like the container itself and the sizing of everything and the background of it. Uh, but with, within here, um, we're allowed to pass in a uh, what I've called as a dice grid. And your dice grid is just actually a list of lists. Um, so for instance, uh, let's look at the first one here. There should be one here. So dice grid, I can actually pass in uh, a list of one and another list of one, all within a list. And um, that will mean that it's basically a grid so that so we're putting in a one, and then in the second one, another one. And this would be, you know, grid two, two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas this one right here is a grid that would be, you know, I can try and find it just to, to show you. So it's actually like this. You see one, 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 two, two, two. So that's, a, you know, just the grid. But uh, that's how we configure it. But how does that actually work? Um, and this part's kind of cool. Uh, so we have um, right here, basically, we go through our... Um, dice grid for all the rows and we create a row and then within the row we create one for each column essentially so just a simple loop within a loop essentially and uh, how do we actually um, you know paint these dice so we have this component called die which is essentially the square you know and the the border radius and stuff is just all handled with basic flutter stuff a bit of padding um, the border radius we take the size of it and divide by six I just found that number looked good because when you you know scale up or scale down I don't want them to look weird they kind of keep some kind of proportion but uh, how do we do the actual dots the uh, we have this thing called a dice painter so I created a custom painter here 
And the painter itself um, is pretty basic, but it finds out like the center, it decides the color, and the color will just always be black in this case. Uh, if for some reason we want a different color, we could pass that in. Uh, the only thing we're passing in though is the dice number. And based on that, there's a switch statement. Um, so we have this function called draw dot, which actually just draws on the canvas at an X and Y coordinate with the dot size divided by two. And then um, we pass in the paint, um, which already has the, you know, the property set there. And basically we just kind of go, okay, if it's one, we're drawing the dot at center and center. If it's two, we want to take the center X minus the spacing, center Y, and so on and so forth, just to basically get these in the right spots. You'll see six, we'll have six of these things, obviously, drawing them in that way. So this allows us to use this component. In fact, the same component is used for these, it's also used for these, and it's even used for um, these big guys here. Uh, so one, you know, one component to rule them all. So there we have when there's dice, and that's an optional thing, like some of them don't have it, so if it's null, if nothing's in it, it's cool. Um, the next thing in that stack is actually the, the text. So I have three different texts you can pass in, what's called a heading, a label, and a hint text. They're all optional, um, but if there's a heading, it renders it kind of in a bigger font. If there's a hint text, it's a smaller font, and labels kind of this in-between, which I think is used in a couple places, like here and here. And uh, everything is uh, everything's good, that's very basic, nothing crazy going on there. Um, and then uh, for the betting chips, so this one, um, and I know we haven't gotten to the state stuff of this yet, but basically if we assume there are um, bids, we actually have a stack of all the bid denominations, which we'll look at later. And uh, what I actually do is I, I loop through them and I put it in a transform.translate and I actually offset it a little bit by the, based on the index. So each one will be actually four pixels higher. And that's how you get this kind of, um, you know, if I, for instance, draw this, oops, uh, we bet here. You see they're kind of like stacked on top of each other, right? They're going up. And that's just the transform, you know, doing that. So there, that's that's for that. Um, and then there's also just something that tells you the total, because you can't really tell from here how many, you know, you count in this case, but if you had a whole bunch of things, you know, it might be hard to know what's in it. So we also have something that just has the total amount there. And that's just in a line going to the bottom right. Um, and I actually set it around a container and based on the bit amount, give it a width. That way it, uh, you know, looks good. Uh, and when you actually get past, you know, 100, it grows, although I can't even uh, show that right now because I don't have enough credits to do that. But uh, maybe I will if we get lucky. So that's uh, you know the game tile from a UI point of view, and and uh, basically the game board is just a whole set of these configured tiles. So um, let's just look at a bit more of the you know the business logic side of things, which I think is the more interesting part. So we'll start by looking at the bid types. So bid type is just an enum. Um, and enums, at least since Dart 3, are really cool because you can actually kind of give them a little more configuration uh, that you can make use of. So you'll see I, um, to do this in Dart, you just create an enum and you can create your first, you know, first entry or whatever. But after all of those, and you have a semi, you want to make sure you have a semicolon at your very end, you can actually set some properties. So I have, uh, for instance, an int called multiplier and basically each bid type has a different multiplier on it, right? Like. Um, you know, this one only pays one to one, um, but this one pays one to, you know, these all pay one to 11, that kind of thing. Uh, so we actually pass that in as the first parameter when we're constructing each of these. Uh, value, and this is used in most of them, is just something I need to make use of. For instance, for double one, um, which is this one right here, in my logic to determine, you know, who's, if you're a winner or not, uh, I wanna know, you know, what value are we talking about that we can compare it to. Uh, so this makes that really easy, and you'll see that in a little bit too. And sometimes it's a secondary value, uh, again, also allows null. And that's for things like these ones right here that we want to know it's a one and a two, or a one and a three, a uh, two and a four, that, that kind of thing. So that's our various um, bid types. Uh, so there's a whole bunch, um, small, big, double one, all the triples, the sums, the combos, um, you know, I got all of them there. The only thing uh, not included, I know it can be in sickbo, uh, maybe there's others, there's also sometimes boards have an odd and even that you can guess on, which works a lot like big and small, but um, the design I was going by didn't have that one, so I didn't try and, try and do it, but it'd be pretty easy to do. Okay, so, um, and then like the logic for actually, you know, determining if you're a winner, um, basically I have a function. Uh, this isn't part of the enum. This is just sort of like a shared function where you pass in a, a reference to a specific instance of an enum of the bid type. So we actually pass in the type and then we pass in the role. And the role will be a list of ints. It'll basically be, you know, three ints in any given case. 
And, uh, you know, this is just where the actual, I think, probably the most like what you would call the game logic actually lives uh, of determining who wins and who doesn't. So for instance, uh, first thing I do, I just sum all of them together because a lot of these require looking at sum and it just kind of made sense to do it in one place instead of multiple. And for the sum function, um, we're just doing a fold. It's just a really easy way to sum a list together. So a fold function, if you look at it, it actually takes an initial value. So we want to start at zero because we're summing. And summing, you would want to start at zero. And uh, basically, this function will run every for every item in the list. A is going to be a reference to whatever the um, whatever the current value is as it's been sort of adding up. Um, so basically, it's the value that gets passed in from the last operation, and this is the value that we're actually you know working with the next one in the list, and we're just going to add a plus b. So this will first uh, you know if the list was something like zero one two. Um, actually, zero would never exist on dice, so let's do two, one, two. The first operation would be taking this two and adding zero to it. So we're now at two. The next operation would be taking one and adding the two that we just did in the last time, getting to three. And then um, we take the three and add it to the two in the third one. So that's just a way to sum it. Uh, this could easily be done in a for loop, um, but this is a lot cleaner and one line. So cool, we sum it. Um, then we just have all these rules uh, based on what the bid type is. So if it's a big, uh, if I bid it on big, um, first of all, there is a small catch in um, in this game, just to give the house a little bit of advantage. Uh, big and small will always lose if a triple is rolled. So first we check that, and we can just go roll.every. If all of them is equal to the roll.first, it means that there's a triple. Um, it's just basically comparing all of them, and if they're all threes, or they're all sixes, or they're all fours, basically if they're all identical, we know, okay, you don't win. <laughs> um, but if the sum is greater than 10, you win. And for bid type dot small, it's the same sort of logic, uh, but the sum needs to be smaller than 11. You'll see at the very end of this, we do return false. So um, you know, I don't have to forcefully return false unless there's a case like this where I, I need to before I check the next thing. Um, so that's for big and small. Um, the double one and double two is pretty easy. Um, and this is where that sort of came in handy of looking at the value of it. So this, this is the value, meaning um, this number that we actually pass in here. So when we're doing double one, it knows right here um, which one, double three, double four, double five. <clears throat> so I can just do this, you know, instead of having a case for each one, which would be a okay way to do it, uh, this allows us to sort of have it, um, you know, with just one call. So if any of these are true, it's going to roll this function or <laughs> call this function. And all it's doing is it's taking the roll and it's finding where the values are equal to that value. So for double one, it'd be looking for ones, for twos. And we just check the length and we want to make sure if it's greater than two, uh, greater or equal than two, it's a true. You won. You know, you won that one. Um, same thing with triple. The only difference is we're checking if it's three. And I, don't, I could do greater or equal than three, but there's only three dice in this game, so that would be unnecessary. Um, the reason I'm doing greater or equal than two here is you still win if you get a triple and you've bet a double, although you're probably kicking yourself. You probably should have voted a triple because the payoff is a lot more. Um, triple any, this is actually um, the same code used up here. So we're just checking if the um, if every roll <clears throat> is equal to the, if every die is equal to the first die, you know, that means we got triple any. And that's this one right here. That's, you can either get three of a kind in ones, three of a kind in twos, three of a kind in sixes, whatever. <clears throat> Um, so then we have a bunch for the sums, and these are just these ones here. And uh, similarly, we're able to use that value metric. So I have the sums here, and sum of four needs to add to four. Sum of five needs to add to five. And that allows me just to have one bit of logic here, right? So if any of these here, okay, cool. We just check if the sum is equal to type.value. And remember, we already have figured out sum up here. Um, combos, <clears throat> this is pretty similar. And this is where the secondary value is coming in. So all we want to do is make sure that the roll contains the first value and it also contains the second value. doesn't matter if they are, um, you know, what order they're in or anything, as long as it, it contains both of them, we return true. Otherwise, it'll return false. And a single one, this one's really simple, just one, two, three, four. We just check the value. Roll contains. Cool. So that's, uh, that's kind of the logic for find outing, finding out if you win. So let's, uh, let's dig into sort of like the state management of this game. 
So um, just to kind of take a step back, uh, I've broken this up. It's pretty simple. We have a source folder. We have the components. We've looked at a few of those already. Um, we've looked at one of the painters. There's a chip painter um, that we haven't looked at, but it's pretty basic. It's just the thing that actually draws you know, these colored guys here. Um, we have models, we have providers, and we have screens. It's just one screen. Uh, so let's look at, uh, I guess we'll look at the models before we get into the providers, just because they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so we'll look at, uh, let's start with this, the player model. It's very basic. Player has a name, um, which, you know, if we, if I wanted to really like make this game, you know, a little more fun, you know, we could ask people what their name is at the start and that's always fun. Uh, ultimately though, all we really care about for the logic of this is tracking their credits. So, um, this is just the model that does that. And then I have a little uh, helper function on this um, where we can add credits. And this will return a new instance of a player using the current player's name and taking its current credits and adding whatever gets passed into here. Technically, this works for subtracting too, because I could pass a negative integer in and adding a negative will um, create uh, that, you know, will, will become a subtraction equation. So that's just our player model, very basic. It's again, really just to do this, but I want to make it a player because who knows, We in the future, maybe there's multiple players and we want them to have different colors and names and an email address or whatever. Um, let's look at, we've already looked at bid type, which, you know, isn't really a model. It's kind of more a, um, it's an enum really, but uh, you know, it's still fits within the world of models, I'd say, uh, especially because it has, you know, this uh, advanced functionality that we're able to make use of. Um, we also have a bid itself. So a bid is any time, it's basically a combination of a bid type. So one of these squares, um, the amount, so whether it's, uh, you know, this one for instance is 52, and um, whether or not it's locked, because what we do, we actually lock the bids once you roll, so you can't, you know, quickly like click roll and, and somehow, you know, add more bids. Um, pretty common in, in any, you know, casino game like this. Uh, and then there's some helper functions on this too, which again return a new instance of a bid because, you know, we always want to, especially with working with, you know, Riverpod and state management, we don't want to be um, modifying. We're never modifying the model. We're always um, creating a new instance of a model that maybe is based off of its existing one. So these are very much like a copy with method that uh, you'd see in freezed or in your own code. Um, the difference is they're a little more functional. So um, I actually pass in this one for adding an amount and all we're passing is a value and it's going to take the bid type. Uh, it's going to take whatever the current amount is, but add that value to it. And it's going to return. It's also going to keep locked as it currently is. Um, subtract amount works the same way. Um, so this one though um, actually checks to make sure that you know we never go ab below zero because um, a bid can't you can't bid negative. So there you go. And lock all this does is return an instance of the same bid or uh, yeah a copy of the same bid, but it sets locked to true. So just some you know rather than using copy widths and trying to put this logic somewhere else, we can do it right in the model. Now the denominations code. Um, this was a little bit complicated and, and you know, uh, but I'll, I'll quickly like breeze through it and I'm not gonna explain every line. Um, but basically what we do is we wanna determine the, so I've created this function that determines coin combinations. And this essentially um, is what determines, hey, given, you know, the number four, let's see, let's look at one, 52, what is the most logical way? You know, if you were giving change back to someone at a store, what's the most logical way to give them 52 coins, uh, 52 credits? And in this case, we'd be using a 50 and a one, and that's what's happening here. Uh, similarly, you know, if I start to do five and add five again, oops, uh, click again, it doesn't put two fives, it does a 10. Um, so this essentially, uh, you know, I'm not gonna walk through this whole thing, but it creates, you know, the best combinations of things um, and, uh, and returns that in a map. And the map basically would be something like, you know, um, one, you need three of them, um, five, you need 10 of them, that kind of thing. And that's what comes back from this. It's basically just a map of ints and ints. And that's what we do here. We get those denominations. And then um, essentially what I want to do is actually um, add these together and then sort them so that they stack properly because I want the biggest coin on the bottom. And that's why if I actually add a 20 to this one, you'll see it actually goes under versus if I add a five, you'll see it goes on top. So that's kind of what's going on there. And it's just a handy way to uh, put all the logic in the model rather than in our UI. 
Um, the only other one is a bit amount, and these are what represent these coins essentially. Uh, so we have 1, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100. So this is a little bit easier to take in probably than the, the other enum that we had. Uh, this one requires a value to be passed in as well as a color. And uh, we just construct them all here, and this allows us to access these later uh, without having to make a bunch of switches and stuff like we would have done in Dart 2. Um, we're able to you know, have them write as part of the enum, and it's super handy. So there's our models. And let's uh, look into sort of the state stuff. So um, let's start with the uh, probably the most important one, round state provider. This is essentially like in some ways, like I could have probably called this the game provider. Um, however, if this, you know, this game evolved and ended up having multiple games like roulette or something in it, um, you know, this would probably not be the best name for it anyways, but uh, probably would rename it, you know, um, sick bow game provider. But anyways, round state provider, it's essentially dealing with like, at what point are we at in this round? Um, so what we actually do is uh, we have this thing called round state, and this is an enum. We're either betting, rolling, or resolving. And uh, by default, we wanna be betting. That's when the game starts. So if actually like green arrow, rebuild, you will see I am in the betting phase because I can actually click and do things. Um, and uh, that logic, you know, has, is spread throughout the UI of like what I, what is shown and what is interactive, you know, based on what stage we're at. Because this is just a rubber pod provider, and uh, you know, ultimately it gets exported here as you know, round state provider um, that uh, that we initialize once, and it's just a singleton that can be accessed throughout. Now, um, through here, we have a few different um, methods that essentially are used, you know, when something ends. So let's just look at that button. So I'm just going to open up the betting board. Um, this is the component that deals with this whole bottom area here. And uh, we won't look at all of it now, but let's look at the button itself. So you'll see here there's a consumer um, and uh, we're getting the round state. So this is that actual like enum. And we can actually do a switch statement on the enum. So if we're betting or rolling, we want to have an elevated button um, and it's going to say the word roll. However, in the case that it's betting um, is the only time we actually want to call a function. If we're already in the rolling stage, um, the function itself actually will be null. And that's why the button kind of goes, you know, grayed out. Because as soon as we get to that phase, um, it is uh, a null function and that just makes the button, you know, disabled. Um, also, if we're, we're in the resolving phase, which we are now, you'll see the button actually says bet and does something different. So how does it actually work? Well, all we do is we run this roll function. So the roll function, um, first of all, the first thing we do is we actually add to the history state, which uh, we don't have to look into just yet, but it's just the thing that tracks kind of like down here, you know, what, um, what was recently rolled, there it is. Um, but what we want to do first is lock the bids. So we actually, um, and this is just the bids provider that looks at all of our current bids and it will go through each bid and it will actually lock them. Um, so it replaces the state with that. But essentially what we do is we set the state to um, round state dot rolling. So we're in the middle of rolling, cool. And we run this function with an await, which is on our role provider. So let's look at the role provider real quick. So our role provider, basically just stores a list of ints. Uh, this will always be three integers. And we call this function called randomize from somewhere else, which uh, is actually being called right here. That's where we click through. And uh, what I actually do is uh, there's a number of animations we can optionally pass in, so five. And that's kind of like how many times we're gonna see like these sort of fake dice do, 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 while it's spinning. Um, and uh, But we could override that if we wanted to. And then we actually just loop through um, the animations. Uh, we increment i each time, so we can use this while loop here. And we actually just set the state by using this random. Um, we're just creating a new list of, you know, we're creating a random, a random, and a random integer. Um, basically, we're saying six. Uh, we want to add one because um, this is, starts at zero. Um, so we get those things, cool. And then we actually just await for 100 milliseconds, and that's what uh, creates so that you can actually see it. If we didn't have this in here, they would it would happen, but you wouldn't actually like see any difference because it would be way too fast. Um, and uh, there you go. Now I have this cool thing just for testing um, debug mode. If I turn this to true, I can actually set what the final value will al always be, and this was helpful in obviously testing out like all the combinations instead of waiting for you know it to happen. Uh, so that's just a fun little fact there. 
So once that finishes, we then um, await for another um, second, and that's just so that there's enough time for um, this. To, so you'll see this stays up for one second. So that's just enough time for you to be able to actually like kind of see it in the big form. If you miss it, you can look down here. It's always visible. And then we run resolve after that. So resolve sets the state to resolving, which means now this is the bet button as we saw. And we actually get our bids and get our role. So we've already looked at the role provider, but let's look at the bids provider a little bit more. <clears throat> um, so our bids provider, it manages a list of bids. And uh, just as a reminder, this is the model. We already looked at this in depth, but it kind of is a combination of a bid type and an amount. So um, we just have a list of them. And at any point, you know, we've created a function that we can just set them. We can also clear them. And uh, we have an add function and a subtract, uh, as well as a couple other ones. So adding, um, basically we pass in a type and we pass in an amount. So let's just see actually the implementation of this so it maybe makes a little more sense. Let's go to the game tile. And we'll see on here um, this function right here. So assuming we can bid, meaning we're at a phase where you're allowed to bid and it's a biddable spot, um, what we do is we get reference to the bid provider right here. And um, we want we run the add function. And we're going to pass in that bid type. And we're going to pass in the amount. So here we have the type and the amount. And first I want to check, like, does it already exist? Um, if it doesn't exist, then we're going to create uh, sorry, if it does exist, so if existing does not equal null, we actually want to take make this new bid by taking you know that same type, and then we actually want to get the existing bid's amount and add it, right? Because we're adding, this would be like, okay, I started with having one on this, uh, let me just, I started by having one on here, but I'm clicking again. I don't want to uh, replace it, I actually want to do it. So we create a new one by incrementing, uh, or sorry, uh, summing the values together. And then we actually just do this uh, quick little one hand um, state change. So we take state and we remove where, you know, the one, the type equals the type. And then we add the new one back in. So in short, we're kind of, you know, combining these together. There you go. In the case that it doesn't exist, it's even easier. We just basically like, you know, add, take the current state and add one more thing into it. This new bid that we're constructing here, which just be the type and the amount passed in. Subtracting works pretty similarly. We, again, just make sure it exists uh, in case there is some issue. And uh, and it basically works the exact same way as this, except um, what we do is we just remove. Um, we, uh, or we're subtracting, so we basically subtract the amount. We get the max of zero and that, because again, you can't have a negative bid. And then we create that bid and we do that same thing up here. There's no else statement here because if it doesn't find one, you can't really subtract anything from it. So if something went wrong somewhere else, let's just not worry about it. Removing, that will just remove all bids from it. Uh, there's no actual implementation of this, but I figured it'd be helpful in the future. Like maybe there's like a, a long hold to remove all or something, um, but that would just remove you know anything when you pass in this bid type. And uh, lock bids, uh, this is the function that will actually go through and it basically loops through the state um, and loops through all the all the bids and locks them and creates a new state. And then I realized actually um, we have to go state equals new state here. Luckily this isn't a problem because I actually am not um, using this in any way. It's just something I thought we would need. Um, but we're going to keep it and this needs to be whatever our model is, list of a bid. So uh, there we go. Just in case we end up using that, that would probably be a hard thing to find that uh, that I missed. Yay. Okay, so that's kind of the bids provider. Um, and uh, so yeah, that, that was just a walkthrough of, of that, but we basically get all the bids and we get the role. Now, if the role happens to be null and that only happens, that will never actually happen in our logic, but technically this is a nullable int because when we instantiate the game, there hasn't been a role yet. So we just want to make sure you know we don't try and do anything with that role. So we just return, but we'll never get to a resolve without a role based on our logic. So it's not really you know something we have to worry about. Um, so here, what we do is we check through. Um, I want to loop through all the bid types, not just ones that have been made. And this is just a way you can do this on enum bid type dot values. So this will actually be a list of all of these things here. And we want to just check if it's a winner. And we have this winning bid types provider, very basic provider. It's just you know a, a list of bid types. And uh, we either clear it or we can add one in. And we check if it's a winner. And we've already looked at this function, right? This is just a thing based on the bid type and a role, you know, if it's a winner. 
And this is what highlights all these things in sort of the lighter yellow. And uh, you'll see, I didn't even bid anything, but you still get this, right? We still want to kind of show, hey, you were so, like if I would have bid here and, and this one won, I'd be like, oh, I was so close. And that's kind of what keeps you playing, I think. But um, so we check if it's a winner. And if it's a winner, we essentially add that type to it. Then we want to calculate something very similar, but only based on the bids that are actually, the player actually made. So here we, um, we run this thing to resolve credits. And this is just a helper function, again, on the bid model. And what we pass in is the role. And first of all, we just check, we use that same function, is winner, because if they weren't a winner, they don't get anything. Um, and we go, if win, we basically, we essentially, or ignore this for a second. This is just one little edge case I had to uh, deal with. But all we're really doing is taking the amount that was bid, um, and the amount is, you know, stored on the bid. So you might have been, you know, in this case, I'm bidding 20. And we multiply it by the type dot multiplier, which is basically, you know, this thing passed in here. The one, the six, one of them's like 60, you know, this one's like really rare. I think there's even a higher one, 180, right? So we're just returning that from here. Um, and now this one little edge case here <clears throat> just handles the fact that these ones right here, if you bid for just like a single one or a single three, you actually get paid, if two threes show up, you get paid two, you know, twice as much. If three show up, you get three much, which is not nearly as much as actually betting, you know, a triple three specifically, but this is a safer bet. Uh, and what we have to do here is if they are any of these single ones, we actually want to check how many were rolled of that one um, and actually multiply it by that much, um, which this is basically like, instead of using a multiplier, it's actually a multiplier uh, this becomes like the multiplier because one would be one, two would be two, three would be three, which happens to work, just work out. Uh, technically I could, you know, and maybe actually should have um, type dot multiplier in here because um, if we decided to change the rules of the game and, and stuff, um, you know, we, we want it to actually account for, where are these, the single, single one, which they are just one and that's why I didn't include it, but thinking like, oh, maybe this game pays you more for these, we, we want to account for that. So I'm going to, I'm going to accept that change. Um, so where were we here? Uh, so we resolve the credits, uh, this returns, you know, that amount, and then we take their credits and add it and we check, um, this will sometimes be return zero. We want to check again if it was a winner, because if it's a winner, we want to also give them back the money that they actually bid, right? Whereas if they're not, we don't. And then this is just something to sort of show some little logic. You might have missed it, but uh, you know it tells you this sort of status message. So we just have this very basic provider, one of the most basic providers. It's the resolve message provider. It just has a string, a nullable string in it, and we can set it and we can clear it. That's all it does. Um, but uh, you know, you won this many credits, you lost this many credits, or you know, zero sum round. And I don't do this every time. This is only if you actually. Um, so for instance, if I uh, clear this completely and bet, you'll see I'm not going to get a message because I didn't actually bet anything. But if I was actually to bet on, um, let's go to the bet round again. If I was to bet on both of these, you actually see I'll get a zero sum round because I lost five over here, I gained five over here. And uh, that's why I have this wrapped in, you know, if your bids are not empty and the credit delta is zero, we do zero sum round. Just a fun little Easter egg maybe. Uh, and then we take our player provider and we add the credits to it. And that's how, you know, this credits is stored here. Okay, so now that we have an idea of all that, um, I'll just show you a bit more of the UI side of things because now it'll make a little more sense, I think. So let's look at the, um, just because we haven't looked at it yet very much, the, uh, in the components, we have the betting board is what I call it. And that's this whole purple area down here. So there's a few different sections of it. The first section is the credits. And basically we have a consumer and we're just watching this thing called the available credits provider, which basically takes whatever the players, uh, the players some uh, credits are and uh, how many bids are on the board by that player. And uh, we, we get that number back. And that's how this number changes. And you'll see, even when I bid, uh, let me go to the betting phase again. You'll see I have, you know, this goes away, this goes away, that kind of thing, it subtracts. So we're just watching that and yeah, we're just passing in credits and the word credits. So that's pretty basic. Uh, the next one is this section here. And what I'm doing here is I'm just looping through all the bid values. So these are these guys here, one, five, 10, 
20 whatever and uh, this is all within a wrap um, which is just you know I could use a row for this but then I'd have to wrap things in padding and um, if I'm thinking of being mobile friendly like maybe we want to use a wrap because these would go to another line when it gets too small um, that's my logic there at least and um, essentially we just have this thing bedding chip and it uh, is basically using another painter to paint it and we're passing in an amount and and there's an on press function and stuff like that uh, and we have a selected option which you can pass in and that's whenever the selected bid is equal to value so value selected bid is this right here we're just watching the bid amount provider which again is just tracking that bid amount and it changes every time I click this so that's how we get that highlighting effect there so that's that one um, then we have uh, another row, and these these two rows that are uh, you know UI wise uh, that are just using a space between, and that's how you know this all goes to this side, and this goes to this side, even when I get smaller and bigger. Um, but yeah, in this second row, if I can find it again, um, we just have a watcher on the resolve message provider, and if it's not null, we basically show a little text thing here, and that's how that text comes up when you either win or lose. And then um, we have these dice here. So uh, this is pretty cool. We just have, uh, we're just watching that role provider. So anytime the role changes, and remember, it'll change a few times within every randomization with that little delay. Um, we're just watching that and we're actually looping through all of them and creating a die um, based on that value. So that's how those guys change. And then we already looked at this one a bit. Um, this is just the thing for the which, uh, handles going between the uh, different stages, the states of the game. So uh, yeah, I think that's good. Uh, I tried to keep it um, a little shorter, you know, 40 minutes, still a little long, but uh, I think there's a lot of goods in here. And uh, obviously, you know, dig into this a little bit more. Um, you can check it out. The GitHub link is below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.